Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I interview Dr. Pat. He recently worked on a paper that was on deloads, and he and his team interviewed 18 high-level bodybuilding and powerlifting coaches on their deloading methods. And in that episode, we dig into people's rationale. We dig into how they deloaded in terms of volume, frequency, intensity, exercise selection, all of that. And we also dig into what they boiled down, the practical take-homes and application for that. I was actually interviewed for this paper, so it was really great reading it and digging into the data with Dr. Pat to see if there was things that I was doing and other people weren't doing or vice versa. So I think this is a great episode because as we say in the episode, this is something a lot of people know about, deloads, and it's really, there's not that much literature to support them or to look into them. So it's really, really a great place to start for that. So without further ado, we'll get into the show. But before we do, I just wanna remind you, we have the mini cut movement. We have a deload in that too. And this is a fast, rapid fat loss, eight week course, where we're gonna strip off body fat very, very quickly. And this could help potentiate further muscle growing phases, mass building phases, or if you're going on holiday or you just wanna get leaner, this is a great group coaching course for you. You can check that out in the description box as well. Otherwise, let's get into the show. You're gonna enjoy it. Hi guys, welcome to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have Dr. Pack on the show. I'm going to call you Dr. Pack, and I'm going to allow you, Pack, to say your last name because Pack is also a short for your first name. But I'm assuming you use that because it's not the easiest for a lot of this us English speakers to, to kind of get that right. Uh, us English speakers. <laughs> Put the flag here. Um, so this was worth dropping whatever I dropped. I hope the I hope people smiled at least. <laughs> so PAC is actually an acronym of my full name. So Patroclos, Andrew Likes Karakak is PAK. And although it became sort of my name when I left Greece and moved to Germany when I was 12, uh, everybody calls me PAC, even Greeks. So yeah, and just PAC, please. No, Dr. PAC. Dr. PAC is just <laughs> for the Instagram handle because Patroclos, Andrew Likes Karakak is as an Instagram handle would not be the best uh, marketing wise. You worked hard for that PhD, so you got it. Like there was years invested in that. So uh, I had one client from Greece called Yanis. Shout out to Yanis, and he initially like introduced himself as John. Everyone calls him John. And I was like, no, I want to call you. I want to know how. Like I don't want to call you Ionis. I want to call you Yanis. I want to say it right because uh, I'm terrible with names generally, but <laughs> I try and make an effort. But if Pack is what you go by, then yeah. that's that's helpful. <laughs> He's a bit more blessed than me with the name because it's cool. We have Yanis Adentokubo, who is the best basketball player in the world, who made oh. the name Yanis. You know, are you are you that British that you don't know who Yanis <laughs> yeah. is? Yeah. Wow, I don't he, follow basketball. It's not at all like <laughs> no. zero. Wow, zero. he he was like the. Uh, well, I know NBA. Michael Jordan, so yeah. <laughs> who, the baseball player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh dear uh people are going to be listening to this and be like who is this this you're sounding pretty mis like mysterious at the moment um i've known of pack for a while been following his work and i was just saying off air how i kind of as i do as a podcast host kind of looking around the industry thinking who who's kind of like up and coming because I, I like to also bring people on who I think are going to make a difference to the industry and things like this. And I definitely feel like Pac is one of those individuals. And it just goes to happen that he was recently, well, the, the paper's probably out by the time this is launched, uh, this podcast comes out. You recently had a study on deloading that came out. Um, obviously, your PhD, however, was on the minimum dose for strength, which uh, as we were talking off air, uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, you're right with your kind of thought about a lot of the listeners. Probably some of them would still be interested in that, but a lot of the listeners here are physique-based. Uh, so they're looking about muscle grains and they're not too fussed about strength. And then minimum sounds like, I don't know, nothing to them. And they're like, if, if that was maximum dose for strength, they'd be like, oh, all over this. Uh, that sounds a, a bit more on my street. Or a maximum dose for kind of uh, hypertrophy sounds pretty cool. But like you said in your bio as well, you research everything and deloads was one of those things, right? Yeah, because um, allow me to note before I talk about deloads that I am working on a systematic review on the minimum dose for hypertrophy, which may interest people uh, like your audience a bit more. 
But yeah, deloads. So I do research because I enjoy research. There's no, you know, financial incentive behind it or a requirement from a university for me to do research. It's more of a case where, you know, I love lifting. I am blessed enough to have a setup uh, professionally where I have time to dedicate to research. And, you know, it's it's cool to, as a coach and as a lifter myself, it's cool to be able to explore concepts that haven't really been explored. And deloads are one of those concepts uh, that are more that are presented as common knowledge when in reality they're common belief because if you look behind the scenes uh in terms it, like if you go if you google deloads and you youtube deloads you'll find like there's a video by jeff nippert with like over half a million views plenty of books by rp you've probably written and and talked about deloads at least in what 10 videos at the very least right yeah i mean they come up we had a deload round table a couple even now so yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's one of those concepts where, you know, for the listener who <clears throat> follows evidence-based practitioners, they, you know, he probably, he or she, they probably assume that, wow, you know, there's there's a ton of stuff behind it. There's uh, studies and studies and, you know, a lot of evidence exploring the concept. When in reality, there's, especially in the context of strength and physique sports, there's nothing. There are some studies on training cessation. Uh, but nothing close to deloads the way we perceive them as coaches and athletes. So it was very intriguing to the idea that, oh, it's more common belief than common knowledge. And I thought it would be cool to do a study on that. But I wasn't alone. This was a collaborative project. This was a team effort that was uh, spearheaded by both myself and Lee Bell out of uh, Sheffield. Um, we obviously had help from other people like David Nolan, Velu, uh, Imonen, Eric Helms, Jake Dalamore, and the one and only Milo Wolf. Shout out to Milo. Um, so yeah, this was a team effort and it was something that Lee was has, has, had already started sort of working on. And completely by chance, I mentioned, hey, I, I, I want to do a study on deloads. And she was like, oh, wow, me too. And then we uh, did this uh, interview study uh, together to sort of form a base for m more research to to come and, and um, sort of use that base for hypothesis testing, right? Because obviously it's not a randomized controlled trial, but I think there's still something to uh, to take from there. And I can touch more on that if you want. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's so well said in terms of the fact that it's kind of a common belief, not common knowledge. And I think a lot of people would think that it's common knowledge. They would be like, as an evidence-based practitioner, if you aren't deloading your clients, that's like against the evidence. It's like, well, I mean, obviously evidence isn't just like published research. There's also anecdote and people in the exactly. trenches, which we'll definitely get into. Uh, but I think that's well stated because I think, again, like it's, it's just somewhere that we haven't investigated. And a lot of like Brad Schoenfeld studies on hypertrophy came from the bros and what they're doing in the gym. And this is the same way. Hopefully it's even better than that. It's like, this is practitioners who have been in the, the field for decades and this is how they're deloading clients. And then you, people might pick, well, Brad might pick this up and put it into practice and see, and see how things are going. So yeah, definitely touch on kind of who the interview subjects were and, and how you went about that process. Yeah. So uh, it's nice that you mentioned Brad because uh, they do have he his lab um, has a deload study in the works. Obviously, in terms of the supply, I, I cannot give you any dates or anything, but I know that there may be something coming from there in terms of an actual training intervention looking at deloads. But um, before I go into the details of of the interview study, I wanted to mention we that we selected interviews specifically because I think in our field, especially. Uh, for people like yourself and your, you know, your coaches and your viewers, doing uh, an exploratory study and talking to some of the best coaches in the world, or at least very experienced coaches that are also athletes and have worked with, you know, hundreds if not thousands of individuals at the highest level, um, I think at this stage can allow us to learn a bit more about the concept and form that base than if we were to do just one study and look at deloads on you know, 20 people and, you know, for eight, eight weeks of continuous training versus, well, you know, three, one, three, what a one, whatever. So I think there's a lot of, a lot to be achieved with interview studies in our field. And it was something I did for my PhD too. And, but we tend to, people tend to kind of snob interview studies because it's like, yeah, yeah, you just talk, talk to some people, but you know, we spoke to 18, we actually spoke to um, 30 people, but some were excluded. Um, but 18 coaches made it to the 
to the study. And we're talking about people that the majority of them had coached at the international level in both bodybuilding, powerlifting, and a few uh, had also coached in weightlifting. So we're talking about people that had coached at the international level, either in the IPF or uh, WNBF. Right? That's correct. Yeah. There, let's go. You got and it. The, <laughs> like the the least experienced ones had at le- had six years of coaching experience. The the most experienced one had twenty years of coaching experience, and I actually can mention some of their names because we did ask for um for permission to to use their names, and the reason I did that was not for the you know for the cloud or anything like that, but rather because you know it is a very exploratory exploratory study, and I feel that people would sort of look at the study with a different knife. They were like, okay, this wasn't just some random coach, but it was him or her sure. or whatever. Like we talked with people like Jason Tremblay, who who uh, is, I think, the founder of the Strength Guys and coaches yep. Taylor Atwood, as well as other lifters, Dr. Andy Galpin, Dr. Eric nice. Trexler, uh, Dr. Lane Norton, the one and only Steve Hall himself. <laughs> I Mike made it through. <laughs> yeah, you did. Definitely. <laughs> Dr. Mike, Cliff Wilson, Christopher Barakat, Brandon Kemper, Marcellus Williams, who is not only an incredible coach and coaches uh, Anton Ruska, um, who is one of the best powerlifters in the world, but is also one of the best powerlifters in the world himself. Dr. Kyle Travis, uh, Dr. Hayden Pritchard, both have done research in tapering for strength, which is, we'll get into it, but it is somewhat connected to deloads, um, as well as people like Queen, Queen Hanok and yeah, a few more that I that I didn't mention that were, you know, exceptional coaches and also happen to be people with uh, doctorate level education, some of them at least, in the, the realm of uh, sports science. So... It was re- uh, really interesting, um, an interesting process to speak with all those people. I think you make a really good point about these interview studies, especially making sure you're interviewing like the caliber of people you're interviewing. I mean, like it's crazy to put my name within some of those names. Like there were people I've interviewed on the podcast as experts, like people you said, like they're, doc- they're doctors, they're PhDs. And so they're applying this. They're almost like I am with my clients. I'm applying this to hundreds of people and almost it's like N equals one studies on each person. And we're getting like the the goal of a coach is to get the best results. So if all of us or like uh, depending on the deloading method that we're using, we're clearly using them for a reason because they're promoting a very good outcome for us. So again, it's like whilst it's not evidence-based, it's almost worth some people who are, are very educated and trying to provide the best results for their clients are using them like they drop them if they weren't providing results right we just would would give up so i think you make a really good point that kind of these interviews can actually be very powerful yeah and for us as practitioners right like for me personally speaking with those individuals um i would trust their the triangulation of well well the collection of whatever they say whatever comes out of their interviews i would as a, as a practitioner, and okay, obviously there is bias here because this was our study, but keep in mind, again, this is an exploratory study. Take everything with a huge grain of salt. More research is needed, etc. But as a practitioner, as Coach Pack, speaking to Steve Hall, who, you know, you're being extremely humble, but you have competed at a very high level multiple times, and you've been coaching for many years, and you've coached bodybuilders at the highest level, as well as uh, body, you know, recreational active individuals. Um, your opinion, and, you know, along with the opinion of people like you, that will inform that that will has a higher chance of informing my practice versus one study on you know a few people for a short duration of time you know because especially if we're talking about um you know hypertrophy you may need a, a much longer study than you know a few weeks to actually take a lot out of it and i'm not i'm not saying that such a study wouldn't be useful it would be extremely useful but as practitioners i think interview studies can can uh, give us quite a bit obviously again with some caution so they, they they shouldn't be completely snobbed but obviously you know it's an interview study it's not an rct absolutely yeah i think i again just well said uh it's on the same way uh, in terms of like like even we we all know it as we hear it like one study doesn't give us like everything but again just like every bit of evidence has to be taken at face value and you can't just trust it blindly especially like you said it's an exploratory study it's not like we're doing like uh data collection on our st- on our each client like you are in a lab for example yeah 
And it may be that all the coaches were, you know, by chance said the, the completely wrong thing because <laughs> it just happened to be so, you know, that's, that's a possibility and we must acknowledge it. But for this particular paper, it wasn't just about, hey, effectiveness of deloads, but rather, how do we define deloads? Um, what's the rationale behind deloads? How do we apply them? So we were, and I did the same for my PhD, exploring the concept is much different than, okay, yeah, we had a few participants and we saw what uh, a, a specific training cessation period did to them. Yeah. And the definition is, the definition is rationale, et cetera. These are all important, uh, important things to to clearly establish in when when they're they're not there you know sorry that was a bit of a weird sentence what i mean is in the literature deloads for strength and physique sports are not well established the definition is not there you know deloads are referred to as unloading weeks training succession some people use tapering interchangeably with, with deloads so it, it was important to okay let's first understand what everybody means you know does everybody think of deloads the same way and so i guess that's a good into like intro into Kind of some of the things you looked at, I like how you split it out in terms of kind of the definition or the purpose, uh, then the rationale and then like application after that. And there's lots of bits we can dig into, but yep. what was, I guess, your overriding definition that you got from the coaches and was, I guess, in each point, it was that it would be nice to know if there was anyone who just was like, I don't know, completely out of the the loop of what everyone else was doing or anything like that. Yeah. So... I'll I'll start by saying okay we'll we'll look at the category definitions and then we'll look at three subcategories training demand differentiating the dealer from the taper as well as interchangeability um, with other terms so in terms of training demand and how uh, people define deloads is they they usually define them as an intentional period of reduced training difficulty another participant said a period of intentionally reduced training stimulus as well as a temporary intentional reduction in workload so easy training again a quote a reduction in difficulty of training uh, cutting back in terms of the total workload that was done so that was the overarching uh, sort of a theme there um which is something again as practitioners that we it kind of sort of confirms what i guess you know we we've we sort of seen in videos and articles about deloads now when talking about differentiating the deload uh, from the taper so what came out of this was that coaches said a, a taper would be specifically used prior to a competition or a deload would be something that you do as part of a training process. A, tra a taper is something you do immediately prior to competition. Um, and But there were people that said that, you know, they may be, a, I guess they're a similar thing, just potentially with a different outcome. And that's where things sometime, sometimes get confused because another participant expressed that the taper is planned, whereas the deload is not necessarily planned. And, you know, but people often use the two terms interchangeably. And that happened in some of the interviews. So tapering versus deloading is often used inter interchangeably. And there were some people um, when interviewed when they were clearly talking about deloads, but said, we probably need to run some some kind of taper just to give you a chance to catch up recovery wise even though they clearly differentiated between tapering and deloading uh, the the lack of sort of a formal definition has these words sometimes used interchangeably which can confuse people especially since they're as 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 it came out from the from the interviews they're different you know one is used specifically before a competition to prepare you for a specific event whereas the other could be at any point in time and it's not necessarily related to boosting your performance for that event so another participant said so just say here's our build up and uh, and volume we're going to taper after and then we're going to get going to an actional to, to to the development block where you know in reality that he was referring to a deload. So that's that's something that um, is worth noting out there. So if you're using the two words interchangeably, that may be something to to change. I was just going to say, uh, I think you mentioned in the paper that quite a lot of the people who were using the more interchangeably were more like bodybuilding and powerlifting coaches, whereas I'm a pure bodybuilding coach. Exactly. And so taper terminology, that's something like, just doesn't come out of my mouth. I just leave that to the powerlifters to talk about because all I do is deload people. Um, the only other thing would be like a peak week for like a bodybuilder. That's a very spe specific thing. But I guess that is somewhat similar to maybe some of the strength coaches who are using it. Kind of they use that taper, which would be our bodybuilding peak into yep. kind of their show there. So that is interesting. And I guess, like you said, that's a, that's a practical take home for people to 
because you have to be careful with your language because it can then confuse other people coming in. They're like, are we tapering or deloading? Yeah. Especially people that are uh, looking to learn because you Google tapering. If you look in the literature, there's literature on tapering on powerlifters, strongmen, um, weightlifters. uh, But tapering refers to, I mean, Kyle, Kyle Travis, Doctor Kyle Travis did his whole PhD on that. So did Hayden Pritchard, Doctor Hayden Pritchard. Um, and yeah, if somebody was to look on PubMed uh, for tapering, they'd come off, uh, they'd come across these studies that are talking about tapering in strength sports. Um, it's it's and you were bang on with your comment about those that that, that used it interchangeably. I know exactly who they were. One was a powerlifting coach, and the other one was a powerlifting and bodybuilding coach, but who competes in powerlifting. So, because these guys are more are exposed more to to strength sports, uh, or you know, primarily strength sports, uh, ah, okay, we're reducing fatigue. Ah, therefore, it's the same, you know. When yeah. in reality, it's not, because with the deload, and this is sort of coach pack speaking rather than the the paper. I mean, we're going to get into the rationale as well, but the, with the deload, you're not necessarily looking to um, boost performance. I mean, ideally, you, you'll see some performance increases, but I- even if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Whereas with the taper, it can't be like, yeah, we're going to taper for your competition. Uh, eh, you did, it didn't work. You you failed. Uh, who cares? You know, it's fine. Yeah, the I guess that the whole purpose of that taper is to promote the best kind of uh, in powerlifting, the best one rep max performance, whereas for a, a bodybuilder going through a deload it's about reducing the fatigue and well we're going to get into this but as i view it kind of reducing the fatigue from the previous meso and setting up kind of the baseline for the one moving forward so whilst they are similar because you are reducing fatigue in both one is specifically trying to get a performance outcome whereas one is kind of trying to set something else up uh, yeah. which is quite different yeah, for sure. And the, the two subcategories under rationale were fatigue management and recovery as well as progression. So for fatigue management and recovery, people expressed that, you know, the primary objective that was underpinning deloading was the management of fatigue. And, you know, they said things like deloads are a strategy for fatigue management and a period of time where we're looking to achieve a reduction in fatigue. Some others um, elaborated a bit more and said the aim is to decrease either true physical fatigue marked by a decrease in performance prior to that period, perceived physical and or men- mental fatigue. So essentially a period of time that allows the athlete to reset to baseline and f- you know feel ready again to push training uh, to progressively overload. Uh, coaches regarded deloading an important facilitator um, for recovery in, in the sense, you know, the deloads were used, or they expressed that deloads could be used for both physical, uh, physiological, and psychological well-being. So, an opportunity to recover and a strategic period of low training intensity, triggered, and low volume with specific function of facilitating recovery. I said triggered because, you know, in strength sports, people say intensity for uh, load, and in bodybuilding, I think more appropriately, people use intensity for intensity of effort, which I think makes yeah. more sense, right? yeah absolutely does i'm always like relative effort can i say that instead or like intensity relative intensity (laughs) intensity of effort push back enough (laughs) with using intensity for load doesn't make sense and And the other oh sorry yeah go on i was just gonna say there was uh i think we're on kind of the rationale part there was someone i i just noted it because i was like i was interested if there was any kind of disagreements with things and it was it was the noted that not everyone agreed that deloads were needed for progress yeah, I don't so, know if you want to come on to that. Yeah, so that's where I was going to get now for progression. So the second objective that was highlighted was to achieve progression in the sense uh, progression referred to the improvement of physiological adaptation that had a meaningful effect on competition uh, performance. So, and this was where we asked one of the sort of million dollar questions, uh, if you remember, where it was, are deloads necessary? And there were people that said you know that uh, deloads were um necessary if so for people that were continuously pushing their body and pushing performance deloads were necessary so periodic reductions in training volume and intensity are necessary for making progress um and deload allows the athlete to reset a baseline in which they feel ready again to push training to progressively overload as we heard but some people also said that deloads are not necessary for making progress. There are f- very few things that I would say are absolutely necessary to make deloads. 
uh, to make progress and deloads are not one of them. Now, I think this is a more of it's a tricky question because you need to, to if you if you start exploring the question, are they necessary? Like what is essentially necessary? Do you need to, can you get huge and very strong? Without deloading, if you sit there and carefully plan everything so that you don't need to deload, potentially. I would say if you're that guy, sure. If you're a recreationally active individual, yeah, you it may come in the form of, you know, some random holiday. But you, again, in that sense, you are somewhat deloading, but maybe it's not intentional. But when it comes to competitive physique and strength athletes, if and if, if we're trying to sort of apply some ecological validity to to how we're viewing this question, it's it's important to understand that physique and uh, and strength sport uh, athletes will push themselves very very hard for long periods of time. So there will come a point where either an intentional or an unintentional reduction in training stress will be necessary, and that's the data from the interviews. But me as as Pack also expressing my own opinion. Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We created the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. Yeah, it's like you said, it's it's not a quick like as soon as you said it, I was, and I can't actually remember what I said in the interview now, but um, it's a immediate thing that comes to mind. It's like, it depends. Like, what's the goal? Who is it? What are we trying to achieve here? But when you specify that it's like, <clears throat> you're trying to get to the, I don't know, as a bodybuilder, you're at genetic ceiling. Are you able to do that without deloading? And it's kind of like you explained there. And that's the way I feel about it too, that you have to kind of stress your body to such an extent for a period of time there's inevitably going to have to be a time where that you're going to have to pull back to kind of build up again, kind of that old general adaptation yeah. syndrome from Hans Seil comes to mind. And then you kind of talked about maybe an injury comes in or whatever it might be. And the quote, I think it's from Dr. Mike. Again, it's like either your deload or your body will deload for you. That that kind of comes to mind at least. It certainly happened to me. I don't know if it's happened to you, Pac, but when I was younger and I had no idea what deloads were, I just keep pushing yes. and then I just start yes. regressing and then I'd kind of get injured. I'd kind of give up for a week or two and then I'd come back and <laughs> we'd go from there. Yes, it's spot on, man. You, like uh, I, I related so much to that. When I started, I was like, fuck, man, why? Can I curse? I, mean, I cursed already. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Apologies. Mike comes like, on here regularly. So. Ah, okay, freaks, okay. Let's, <laughs> let's start. Um, but I was like, man, I feel horrible this week. <laughs> Training feels bad. It's no pumps. Nothing is happening. And I, I, it would always make me feel horrible psychologically. But that resulted in me skipping a workout, skipping another workout, maybe eating a bit more not moving as much. And then the next week I was like, oh, okay, we're back on. Okay, cool. Uh, and I hadn't understood that it was probably time for me to take a step back. At the moment, the way that works, because I'm on a, I'm traveling a lot and my training is sort of constantly freestyle. I, I train consistently every week, but there are weeks where training is a bit less than others. And there are weeks where I need to take it easy because I've pushed myself too hard. But anecdotally speaking, as coaches as well, and okay, obviously that's that's what that was the purpose of the interview. But I have I have had individuals, recreationally active individuals, who didn't need a deload for some time, for quite a quite a while. But for stronger and more advanced trainees, especially competitive uh, strength and physique athletes, it is very 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 rare that you will find somebody who at some point won't need to take a step back. You know, yeah, very rare. 
And but to, oh, sorry. So I was going to say it's to the point where, like, even if they again, if they try and force the issue, it's just nothing good happens from that. Like they yeah. they have to pull back. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, it's it's obviously a, something that we need to investigate further, and I'm not saying hey everybody will always need to 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 deload. And and that's why we there, there are certain signs that we look out for that we will touch on l- later on. So the next category was application and like how do you actually deload? And the main one of the main subcategories was training volume. So they either um, so the coaches mentioned that you know you either reduce the number of the number of sets per uh, per session or per week. Um, many people reduced somewhere around uh, f- f- from anywhere from the. By by twenty five to fifty percent, excuse the the choke there. And those who are involved in physique sports tend tended to be a bit more conservative in alterations in training volume compared to strength coaches. So strength coaches were more likely to preserve training volume in the competition lifts and just cut off stuff from the accessory training volume, whereas physique coaches had a more flexible general approach to training volume. So they either decreased sets or reps or everything. So some people said I would reduce total volume by something like 30 to 40%. Um, another person said a deload is reducing volume by more than 50%. Generally, another person said the volume of training is brought down by about half, if not more. But you can see that um, cutting volume significantly, whether that being 25 or 30 or 50 or 40%, was something that was expressed by most people. And it was interesting to see that a reduction in training volume during the deload was not always uh, conceptualized as a global training modification. And I'm re- reading off the paper here. Instead, they they said that they could achieve that by reducing volume uh, in specific muscle group exercises or in case of strength sports, a reduction in specific exercises. So some people said that, hey, sometimes a deload is done specifically to a muscle group because the muscle group has been mildly injured and needs several, several days of recovery. And some other people said deloads for them were kind of movement specific. So like we could deload squat and deadlifts or strength sports, but, you know, give bench some time to continue as normal. Um, and that's something that I, I'm currently doing with, with I've, I've currently uh, been doing with a couple of clients, a couple of powerlifters where their squat and deadlift needed a step back, but their bench was progressing nicely. So we, we didn't touch that. That's very interesting because I think that is something... Uh, at least I remember the the deload roundtable I had between I know Menno and Mike had like differing approaches here where Menno was kind of I think he was not uh, I think he was kind of exercise specific deloading and then uh-huh. everything else would keep running whereas Mike would be like a global deload for everything and maybe we there would be some exercise specific ones kind of within the mesocycle what have you so it's interesting that that also came through into kind of this as well and it sounds like the powerlifters, like you mentioned for your clients, they're more specific for lifts that are like if they're regressing or if they're plateaued, kind of deload that but progress everything else. Yeah, if it makes sense. But for simplicity's sake, and again, coach, uh, my personal opinion, um, I think for a lot of people, if it happens to be that your legs are shattered and everything else is flying you know you as a bodybuilder you're telling me yeah man quads and hamstrings are off like i'm sore for five days but everything else feels amazing cool yeah why why deload everything else but most times again from experience um and that's i think what came out of the data as well because there were only a couple of people that that mentioned specific deloading most people it makes sense from a logistics point of view unless you're working extremely close with an athlete extremely extremely close that you deload um everything um it, it usually is the case that they need a general deal maybe arms need a 20 percent deload and uh, legs need a 30 percent deload but at the end of the deload everybody will be will be fine yeah yeah it's that and often uh, at least yeah, in my own experience and with trainees it, it is a case that you get to this kind of period of time where systemically you're just yep. kind of completely like you're just in that state of demotivated to train just beat up and exactly. whilst you might be able to push something a little bit it's like why not reset everything almost and go again yeah from a psychological standpoint as well because yeah maybe it's not maybe you're taking it easy on the legs but going and getting psychologically aroused and pushing you know i don't know upper upper training push pull whatever that may then have you 
very tired the next week and then you start pushing legs again but then you feel like oh, i needed a, a relaxed week when am i going to get that anyways yeah. terms of conditions apply as with everything in life uh, <laughs> the next subcategory in terms of ap applying deloads was intensity of effort and there's the magic uh magic word for actually describing intensity. So participants described how reducing, uh, so how reducing the amount of effort was done um, by essentially modifying RPE uh, and, you know, uh, alterations in internal measures of perceived, uh, perceived effort, like going to failure. So it was common for participants to refer to ratings of perceived exertion, RPE and repetitions in reserve. And, Overall changes in intensity of effort were closely linked to changes in training volume and participants often described deloading as the synonymous management of training volume or intensity of effort in many cases, or in many cases, both, if that makes sense. Again, reading yeah. of the manuscript. So some people said a deload is a period of training where you reduced intensity or volume or both a period of time with reduced training volume and or training intensity. Um, in most cases, a deload for me said the participants is both a reduction in training volume and a reduction in intensity. And participants achieved that reduction in intensity of effort through either a change in external load, so the weight they used, or through internal training demands such as an alteration in proximity to muscular failure. Now, let's make the assumption that by failure, we mean momentary failure to the point where somebody is attempting an, a concentric repetition and they are unable to do so just for the sake of, of this. So... In some cases, the loading was achieved through a, um, a reduction in external and internal measures, so where they reduced both. Um, some people said for them, oftentimes in the sense of absolute loading, in the sense of absolute loading rather than just RPE, but typically a combination of both. So some people usually reduced both the load on the bar and the RPE or increased the RIR. But in general, training was um, made much easier than it was before. And several participants considered alterations in intensity of effort secondary to reductions in training volume. So in the sense that a reduction in intensity of effort was only applied to the deload if reduced training volume had not resulted in the desired decrease in fatigue, which is interesting to hear. Um, and it, there were several people that mentioned that. So some people said if they really pulled back, um, if like if the way they expressed it is if they are really pulled back I reduce load a little bit too. So if they're not going to failure, so they're not going to failure. If they're really, really beat up, maybe we really pull back load and, or if they're really beat up, that's where I would even err on the side of just taking some more days off. Some other people said, I would like to recommend to the athlete to maintain their intensity. So load through that time, generally speaking. But if I had someone who came in with some connective tissue issues, I would probably vote for reduction in intensity as well. I think that's where the, the difference between strength and physique sports becomes a bit more apparent where handling heavier loads um, for some strength athletes may be beneficial to maintaining certain adaptations um, and still getting some comp-specific practice, albeit much easier uh, uh, practice. Whereas for a bodybuilder, such as yourself, it may not make much sense for you to go and do a, you know, a heavy three-rep set on chest press. Yeah, that that is very interesting that a lot of people are, like there's differences in terms of, people pulling back on relative intensity or intensity of effort there and because we already mentioned like the psychological components so i can't imagine uh like still kind of training very close to failure for a portion of that week still being challenging there but again that's my own kind of personal bias and my my coaching but again like you said uh, and i have heard this more in the powerlifting scene for sure that if you go too light for an extended period of time they kind of lose that specific practice uh, that they normally would have and so that can have some unwanted kind of maybe performance detriment coming out of the deload so I can definitely see the the kind of differences there and actually that's uh, a good question uh, to put towards people is like and I wonder I don't know if you asked this to the uh, to the um, coaches like you deloading your powerlifters different to your bodybuilders the ones that coach both yeah we so we did touch on that uh, a bit but uh, I think because the, we had coaches that were coaching both, we needed to sort of differentiate. And that's what came off um, with, with some of the responses. But with the way we've presented the data is not as clear as the, the way you expressed it now. But on intensity of effort, 
there were other participants that considered a reduction in training intensity as a primary aspect of the deload. So some favored a reduction in intensity uh, of effort over training volume, um, which is interesting. So even even, even though the, the main theme was reduction, you know, intensity of effort and in general making training easier, there were people that would rather scale back the load. Others would just scale back volume and leave load the same uh, and then maybe modify intensity of effort or RPE or RIR a bit. Uh, some that did all together, but overall you see that there is not a clear like one way to, to go about deloads, which was yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, I wonder if that even comes down to that coach's f- like programming in terms of f- for the outcome. So are they on the side of set progression, for example? So they're coming into that deload with high numbers of sets. So volume has to be a key thing that they're bringing down because that's a big contrib- contributor to fatigue versus someone who, I don't know, they favor low volumes. And so they kind of don't feel like they need to really reduce the set numbers, but they're like, wow, we're training at low volumes at high intensities all the time. Let's reduce the intensity. But I guess that's something to think about <laughs> versus we know. <laughs> yeah, ex- and and I think like, as, as coaches as well, we know that that can be very context dependent. Yeah. And where you are in a mesocycle, how far away you're from comp, what feedback the athlete is giving. Um, the, 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 ni- the one positive thing that is coming out from these interviews is that there's many ways to approach this. So, you know, we, again, we're talking about very high level coaches from both strength and physique sports and the fact that they, yeah, overall, as long as intensity of effort is somewhat reduced through any way that, that helps you, as long as you're reducing intensity of effort, you're covered. Now, if you want to do it, if your athlete likes lifting somewhat heavier, although easier, maybe you do it that way if you've seen that works. If it's, okay, we're going to make training super easy, then that might be the way. It may be that you have to add an extra day off, which is a nice segue to training frequency because... Um, so the way they conceptualized training frequency was as the number of training days undertaken during deloading, um, you know, pretty normal. So overall, participants aimed to maintain their training frequency during the deload. But if the athlete perceived, um, if the athlete was too fatigued, they would consider to reduce and scale back in terms of training frequency. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense to me, especially if like volumes coming down that frequency potentially could therefore kind of be manipulated and especially if you're trying to reduce that psychological fatigue like just going to the gym and warming up and being like i've got a deload session (laughs) screw this uh that could be nice to have some extra days off but like you said uh, i like that it's individualized in that they're looking at the person that they've got in front of them and what's driving their fatigue or what have you and psychological physiological fatigue and kind of individualizing that outcome and also the fact like you mentioned that like with lots of programming, there's like an overarching theme of fatigue reduction that we're trying to achieve with the deload, but there's many ways of getting to that outcome. It's not like a one like textbook way of doing so. Yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, again, as, as practitioners, we have been exposed to many different uh, cases of, of uh, you know, no athletes who enjoy different different approaches to taking it a bit easier some people will say hey uh, busy week can we deload sure um i'm not i'm not sure if i'm gonna make it to the gym five times this week that's fine you could go three times per week just make sure the training is not very challenging get most of like try to sort of mix and match the session so you get a few sets per muscle group in and that's that. Other people will be able to do the exact same training frequency as before because the deload is more planned and more, you know, proactive rather than reactive. And they'll be happy to go in the gym five days a week and just do exactly as they were doing before, just in an easier manner. Yeah. And yeah, in terms of duration, so participants describe the duration of the of, of the deload and they they agree that the precise duration would be individualized to the athlete, but for most participants. Spoiler alert, the typical deload would be one week, but some participants said that, hey, shorter deloading periods might be suitable uh, for uh, individuals due to the risk of detraining loss uh, caused by loss of physiological adaptations, which I found interesting personally. I mean, I don't think you're losing many adaptations, if any, if you, you know, trained three times that week instead of five, or if you take a seven day deload versus five but you know it wasn't yeah. me getting interviewed <laughs> yeah yeah i think you had some data to kind of back your 
thoughts up that you have there as well in terms of like research in terms of how long it takes to lose muscle or lose strength that sort of thing and so i uh, yeah i think and it, it's like you brought up previously too in terms of practicality a lot of people work on that kind of monday through sunday week and so if, like a lot of us are coaching just people that want to work through that so if you take i don't know a four day or a three day or a five day it sometimes can just mess with people's kind of hey i do legs on monday so yes. it's just like well we have a we we'll take a seven day deload then even though if that's not completely necessary but it was it, it that that aligns with what i think most like you said spoiler alert kind of jokingly that i think everyone assumes a de- deload week is even i think what people think when you say deload they say deload week yeah and until we have you know 20 rcts with different uh deload lengths uh, different athletes uh and uh, which we won't I, I i wish if i ever become a millionaire uh, <laughs> by by luck i will make sure we do but until then it's difficult to say for sure but i'd be if i had to, to place a bet i would i would put my money on hey a week is it's just fine you know it seems yeah. like uh, most people are doing that and it has worked well for them now there was an interesting subcategory called exercise variation. And I remember a few interviews uh, uh, distinctively where, so deloading was viewed as an opportunity to vary exercise selection uh, for by most participants. However, um, the rationale for such variations was different between coaches. So some people said changes in exercise selection allowed for the opportunity to reduce training monotony by changing things up, to quote, particularly for athletes that enjoy a lot of novelty. For others, Exercise variation served up to reduce the potential for overuse injuries and encourage recovery by removing spinal loading exercises. So for participants that, you know, use exercises that load their spine quite a lot and very often. But for all participants, though, the choice of exercise still had to achieve carryover and purpose relative to the goal of the overall training program. So one person said the deload is absolutely a chance to add new movements as long as the movements have a purpose, you know. So something that... Um, or, you know, something that they want to try or something that can transfer to the training. So if somebody, another participant said, if somebody was doing a barbell back squat, maybe that day on the deload week, you know, they could do Smith squats or a hack squat or something like that. And some other people conceptualize it as a potential washout period. So they said, I also think of it as kind of a transition period or a potential washout period where you're introducing some novelty for the sake of novelty to almost desensitize or reset the training stimulus if you feel that performance has plateaued or that training response has been blended. So, but not all participants would vary that, but would vary exercise selection during the deload. So some said um, that intensity of uh, effort and training volume were favored uh, above exercise selection. And this was uh, in part based on the competition level of the athlete with high performance strength athletes likely to maintain specific exercise within a deload, but at a lower demand. So, one person said, if an athlete is training just for fun, I'll give them oil in variation. Whereas if, you know, an athlete is training for a world championship, I wouldn't, you know, we're very focused and it would be volume, intensity and effort that I would adapt, you know, but those would be the only variables one would mess with, said another person. So it's one participant also said that novel exercises might be counterproductive in the deload due to the increased risk of exercise-induced muscle soreness. So they said, because of the repeated bout effect, we may end up with actually more soreness using a brand new movement, which kind of defeats the purpose of the deload anyways, which I think is is an interesting point. At the same time, you know, if you're keeping things relatively chill during a deload and you're you're not working with an absolute beginner or you're not doing some super weird, uh, I don't know, bamboo bar, Single leg pistol squat, YOLO exercise. I think it's very difficult that if you do, you know, incline chest press instead of uh, dumbbell, uh, dumbbell press, that you're going to be there at an RAR of five, that you're going to be sore and you're going to impact recovery. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though. It's reality and we know how to do it. And we will help you achieve this. The mini cup movement 
is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cut movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together. Yeah, that's uh, I think one of the points, the really key points he said there in terms of exercise selection was, well, again, it's individualized. So it sounds like, especially like on the strength side, like they have some specific movements that they're doing, but it's a case of if they're the movements, those specific movements are beating the shit out of you and they're the things that's driving fatigue. Maybe they're like super strong people, like you mentioned, you deload those. But if it's someone else who they're not getting beat up from those movements too badly, the specificity of maintaining those might be nice the next block. But I guess the overall message was that there's a purpose. It's not like you're... I'm, I'm not programming my clients like, oh, let's have some novelty and variation. Let's do some bozable squats and like some burpees and stuff like this. It's still, like you said, if it's a squat, it's a squat pattern that's specific and kind of very um, kind of related to the movement you're doing. And it's the novelty thing is something I flip flopped on personally. I can't remember what I said in the interview, to be fair, but something I used to say was you should keep the same movements because the novelty, there is that risk of that kind of um muscle damage due to a new movement but having gone through it myself like as a trainee like you said if you're doing something very light easy it you're not going to cause a load of muscle damage it's just not enough stress if you're at a five rp or even higher than that so or rar sorry so i've flip-flopped on that one so I, I can't remember where i was with that but it's funny someone brought that up it may have even been me i don't think it was at that point though it, it's it's definitely interesting and again you know context dependent i don't want to be the guy that says hey you do you bro namaste you know but at the same time if you're working with somebody who's like hey steve could we try i want to play with a play around with a safety squad bar uh, during the deload my sets will be super easy i just want to give it a try see how it feels you know yeah would you say no i, I wouldn't yeah yeah i'm 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 with you on that one and then i guess was there uh one more, yeah, one more after, oh no, two more things after this uh, exercise variation. You're on individualization, periodicity. <laughs> periodicity. I found that word hard to write when I was writing it, let alone to say it. I don't know yeah, why it's not one so I've come across that much. A blast through um, individualization, periodicity, and then last but not least, proactive versus reactive. So just so we don't make this, you know, super saturated. So for individualization participants described the role of individualization when uh, organizing training during a deload so what they did is um, individualization was contextualized in two ways one the need for undertaking a deload is highly variable between athletes and two the manipulation of training variables during the deload requires individualization so for all participants and similarly to what we've expressed on here as you know coaches ourselves adjusting the deload to suit the needs of the individual athlete was more important than following a generic approach or a rigid system and you know the individualized approach to deloading was multifactorial with several factors influencing how the deload was organized and prescribed those included the level of ability personality of the athlete importance of competition chronological and training age so uh, you know, biological sex was not considered to be a determining factor by any participant, which was interesting because we have heard that in the past, you know, women can uh, take more or recover better. Uh, but interestingly, uh, when uh, when constructing a deload, people said that biological sex is not something that influences the way they structure a deload, um, which personally, I, I agree with. Uh, if the, the signs are there, the signs are there. Um, and in terms of periodicity, per periodicity there you go um, <laughs> it refers to how frequently participants would prescribe a deload during the overall training program and in this subcategory participants mentioned that the periodicity of the deload would be again highly individual with coaches suggesting that athletes would undertake a deload every few weeks and the, the range that came out of the interview was quite broad anywhere from three to 12 weeks but 
Some people said I'd say between four to six weeks on average. Uh, some others said, but I would say probably anywhere from six to twelve weeks. So again, uh, not a specific answer, and it's something that you'll you'll figure out with your athletes. And that takes us to the final sort of uh, category: being proactive versus reactive. So participants describe the implementation of deloading as either proactive, so predetermined, or reactive, sort of auto-regulated. So in this sense, participants um, elucidated the advantages and disadvantages of deloading at pre-planned time points uh, within the training program versus taking the deload only when needed, to quote someone. A, sp a very small number of participants, which I found interesting and fit my bias, um, he favored the use of pre-planned deloading. So some people said that, you know, I use pre-planned deloads for my athletes, but others avoided pre-planned uh, deloading, favoring a more reactive auto-regulated uh, auto approach where they said things like, you know, you're seven weeks into this plan and you're still getting stronger. Why would we stop and deload? If you're telling me you're feeling good, energy is good, like we don't need to stop yet. We will at some point, uh, you're not going to be able to go forever, but let's keep going. So, however, stated that a flexible approach that combined reactive and proactive deloading would be optimal with pre-planned deloads acting as checkpoints to assess the need for deloading rather than uh, compulsory changes to programming. So at times participants described a range of factors that might influence the use of proactive to reactive deloads. So those range from competitive level and experience of the athlete and non-training commitments, so work, stress, holidays, to previous knowledge of how the athlete responds to training. And just to finish off uh, this section with one quote, Typically, when my athlete deloads, it's because they've got some sort of external stressor that they have to deal with, you know, relationships, job, injury, whatever the case may be. Those are more the times that we implement an actual deload. And another person said, so I lied. This is the last quote. For my advanced athletes, the deload is more reactive rather than proactive. And then for my novice and intermediates, it's more proactive than the reactive. And yeah, anecdotally, from personal experience, that's the case. I have had people who... You know, um, one comes in mind, super strong individual, close to 120 kilos, deadlift well in the uh, mid 300 kilo range. That person needed deload every three weeks. So three hard weeks of training. And we had agreed fourth week is a deload. He enjoyed it. It worked well. We did it. Other athletes, it we've I've had athletes where we needed a deload after four weeks and then after eight weeks. So whenever though, whenever fatigue is way too high, that's when we deload. Yeah, the uh, the outcome there absolutely fit my bias as well, uh, and well, probably what I said I probably added to the to the to the to it confirming my bias because I was part of it. But um, yeah, I find it's like you mentioned there. If you got that one guy every fourth week, he generally needs to deload. You might have then someone else who maybe they're more gem pop, they're nowhere near as strong. Maybe they end up missing sessions or whatever it might be. Like every fourth week might be an absolute joke to them, where they like feel like they're just getting into the thick of things. Whereas for him, he's feeling completely destroyed. So that very much aligns with my experience too. And like as it came has come across overall like it has to be individualized like you have one guy like in contest prep he needs to deload because he's got a specific show and maybe i'm pre-planning deload so that we know where we're going to end up for that kind of end date same with like a powerlifter i guess who knows he needs deloads and then he's going to taper at a certain point maybe you have that kind of pre-planned whereas if you're that same individuals in their off season they're kind of just gaining momentum and maybe we're in that fifth week where maybe we'd normally take deload in a sixth but like you mentioned like everything's ticking the box for i'm still feeling good why would we pull back at that point i'm still going until the signs for deloading are needed so uh, i like that kind of we have an idea of where a deload would be necessary because we understand the athlete and what they're putting through themselves and where fatigue's going to get to at a certain point. And likely you'll probably have to deload here, but it, it might be pushed back or forward a few weeks. So yeah. I'm glad that kind of was aligned with what other people were saying too. <laughs> yeah, what we should do is we could do uh, two interview studies. I interview you for the one study and you say whatever you like and then <laughs> vice versa. And then we can have two studies confirming our practices. And there we go. <laughs> Evidence-based, uh, redefined. <laughs> yeah, that would well yeah i mean um i don't know where to go with that i have thoughts on my mind i'm not going to say um then you came to i guess practical application for people that was like yeah. the final step the final step yeah so the the i hope to one day become the infamous table three so and a huge shout out to lee for taking charge of the the manuscript um so table three aka general guidelines for the prescription of deloading strength and physique sports. So I'll just read through that. It's 
how you manipulate the different training par uh, parameters. So the first training parameter is training frequency. So a recommended adjustment during a deload will be wills, uh, whilst some part practitioners might consider a reduction in training days during the deload, training frequency will typically remain unchanged relative to normal training frequency. In terms of training volume, a reduction in training volume by approximately 30 to 50% achieved through a decrease in either repetitions per set or by a reduction in the number of sets per workout. Um, so that's a way to reduce volume. And volume can be reduced in all exercises per session or by reducing the number of accessory exercises if you're a strength athlete. Another training parameter is in intensity of effort. And the adjustment there would be a reduction in the intensity of effort uh, by increasing proximity to muscular failure. So by adding one to three RIR for each set performed, by removing repetitions per set while maintaining absolute load, or by reducing the absolute load, for example, by 10% while keeping the repetitions constant. Additionally, um, or in combination with an increase in proximity to muscular failure, um, a decrease in, in relative loading could happen. So for example, six repetitions at 80% of one RM rather than the three repetitions at 90% of one RM could be implemented to facilitate the necessary reduction in the intensity of effort. And in terms of exercise selection, the deload, so the adjustment there would be the sport specific. So the deload provides an opportunity to vary exercise selection as appropriate, as we talked about. So, there are certain um, terms and conditions that come with that. Typically, sport-specific muscle groups or movements will remain in the training program uh, or should be exchanged for similar exercise movements. This will provide the athlete with some novelty and reduce monotony, but will maintain a level of training specificity. But it should be noted that excessive changes in exercise selection might result in unwanted muscle soreness. Therefore, caution should be taken when making large alterations in programming. programming. And duration, as I said, um, five to seven days while uh, it is important to approach the deload on an individual basis five to seven days where it's at periodicity last but not least so for pre pre-planned pre training programs deloading can be scheduled every four to eight weeks depending on the training demands uh, where for individualized training uh, the approach might not be advantageous where individualized training is not possible so for example a team or a group environment for training programs that adopt an individualized auto-regulated approach, the loading should be approached flexibly and integrated into the training program only once sufficient objective and subjective data have been collected to justify changes to existing programming. So in that sense, uh, the loading should be prescribed as required. And periodicity of deloading is in part related to the preceding block of training. So deloading will be likely required after a period of overreaching, but less likely during prolonged periods of continuous training, uh, where the overall training demand is relatively constant. And I think that gives How people... How are my reading skills? <laughs> Better than mine. Uh, <laughs> so I think that gives people a really nice starting point. I think, unfortunately, people love these black and white kind of cookie cutter almost approaches sometimes. Um, but I, as a take home for me, at least whenever I'm talking to athletes about deloading, I don't know if you're the same pack, but it's like less is more in my mind in a deload. Mm -hmm. Like if you're thinking, should I push harder or should I do more? And you're not sure if you should, I'm like, don't <laughs> like it. Uh, don't do more because um, like the biggest way to reduce fatigue is like, f as we're seeing here is like pulling back, making things easier generally. So if you're thinking, should I make things harder or easier? especially for a bodybuilder, I find like the chances of you losing these adaptations and performance being down is much more likely if you push too hard during this week and don't get that recovery versus mm -hmm. going too easy. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been really interesting seeing like every person's different approach here. And something I, that just came into my mind was pulling some of the most popular programs maybe out there on the internet. I'm not like Jim Wenders 531 comes to mind or something like this. I haven't done any of these programs for ages, but just these programs. And I wonder if they align with what has been put through here. And it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of them do align with kind of the most popular kind of product productive programs that seem to be out there align with kind of the recommendations that you've outlined there. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people will reach the end of the episode and be like, oh, okay, yeah, we've heard this before, you know? <laughs> Because uh, in the sense that we nothing revolutionary came out of the it was it was interesting to sort of somewhat confirm some of the stuff that we were um, you know we knew and we had seen in in, in other videos, but also um, understand or explore the nuance of some of the subcategories of how to deload. But overall, you know, if you want the TLDR version, take a take a an easy week whenever you feel absolutely shattered and that's that and i think the great thing is like 
I didn't know who else was being interviewed, nor did there like there's people on there who I don't know who they are, maybe even. And like we've come to the same sort of conclusions and we've worked out that this is working productively for our clients and athletes, which is always a nice thing. So it, it kind of confirmed like it's not like we're all talking to one another and like, oh, this is how we should do it. It's everyone's come to this point kind of collectively uh, on their own. So if the you would expect, I guess you, I don't know if you expected this to happen when you were doing the study. I guess you didn't even have a, like, what, I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea what you would maybe expected if you thought everyone would align so, so closely. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was relatively, I didn't know what to expect. Uh, I expected that I wasn't expecting to hear anything, you know, crazy, like, yeah, the Ludwigs, we're going to be training harder than before because uh, during the minimum dose studies, I did hear some stuff that I didn't expect. But yeah, most of the things were in line with what we, the common belief um, sort of that we already had about deloads, obviously with some variation, but it was very much aligned to if we were to pull a few random deload videos from the internet, you know, maybe some from your channel and then some from, from other channels, um, we could look at those and be like, oh, okay, that this is, it seems relatively similar to what came out of the interviews. Obviously, some things may not be there, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's one of those areas where now and then you see some interesting protocols being done during deloads, and I think often it's uh, the thing people deloads often. I think have that when you hear it, you're like, as an athlete, they're just it's something. It's like brushing your teeth. It's kind of like something you have to do. But as a, a coach, you feel you you're like, you, I don't brush my teeth. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's just great. And water <laughs> kinda... flossing. <laughs> oh, I had, uh, I'm not going to talk about water flossing. We're going to continue. <laughs> uh, so it's, yeah, it's one of those things that's kind of accepted as you have to do. And the, the times I see something, I don't know, someone tries to make it more exciting than it is. I, I think in many ways, it's just like, you just got to do it <laughs> and yeah. accept it. And when you train hard enough, it's kind of like, you have to do it in a sense and also you could almost look forward to it as well so that's at least where i've come uh, with my experience with deloading where initially i was always like ah, do i have to and it's like yeah yeah i do <laughs> and and my point there would be if you don't have to don't do it but ooh, like even the the freakiest of people on the, the with best genetics and the the best sort of um, special supplements uh you know have to deload like we all love training and i have never i have never seen anybody say yeah love it 12 weeks non-stop pushing myself to the limit can't wait for week 13 you know but hey if you can do it more power to you yeah yeah actually that's a very good point like you don't need to until you do uh so i think we can wrap it up there actually so I, sure. I want to thank you pack for coming on i'm definitely gonna have to re invite you on again and just interview coach pack a little bit more and i mean still the researcher but uh, uh, i'm definitely interested in your point of view and perspective on things if people want to learn more from you and kind of see more of your research where should they head um i think the best the best place would be my instagram account which is dr so dr double underscore pak because the other username variations were not available even though i personally messaged the inactive accounts that have all those variations like accounts with zero posts and zero followers um that would be the best place everything there's a link in my bio that could take you to all my research gate google scholar etc profiles and you can if you have any questions about the project the project will be available as a preprint by the time the episode is out that will be available for you to read keep in mind a preprint is not peer reviewed yet um but it is currently it has been submitted for peer review so it should be out as a peer review on a peer reviewed journal um at some point soon fantastic and if there Thanks. is uh like a lot of follow-up questions or what have you like comment them below and you know, like i said i'm going to bring pack back on so i can definitely ask some of those and yeah thank you so much for coming on um thank and you. guys thank you for listening i'll make sure everything you just talked about there will be linked in the description and we'll catch you soon take care So I'm Steve Hall, founder of Revive Stronger and a coach of Revive Stronger. My name is Pascal Flor. I'm the co-owner of Revive Stronger and also a coach, of course.
We Revive Stronger has probably been going solidly for three years, probably roughly about three years. Revive Stronger to me, it is becoming kind of my child, my foster child. It's the gathering and getting together of like-minded people. We've been expanding the coaching team, which is helping us help more people, uh, but each coach can only help a certain number of people. Right now, it's all over the place. We have YouTube, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, but there isn't that community aspect behind that. And so the next step for us is developing a membership site. So basically we want to create a family and a community that is then benefiting from another. A really cool community for people within our little niche is gonna be a website. They will get early access to our podcast. You can access us, ask us questions, the community aspect. We have a forum there, you can ask questions, but also you can, you can lock your journey. There's also gonna be courses on there, courses, presentations on different topics. Discount of past seminar footage. We will log our journey as well. We'll start vlogging. We're gonna have documentaries, our entire athletic journey. Furthermore, they get access to an exercise video library. The exercises that we love for hypertrophy and maximizing hypertrophy, we're gonna go through those in depth, telling you how to execute them. We kept them concise and also mobile friendly so that you can watch them in between your sets. I'm super excited to grow this community. The amount of value that we're gonna be delivering is huge. And I'd love you to be part of it. You will get so much out of that. I'll see you inside.